Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August meeting of the Global Health Youth Organization. My name is Noraldine, and I'm a co-founder of the organization, and we are very excited to see everyone who joined us today. I want to thank everyone for joining the meeting and working around any scheduling or time zone issues that you might have had. As for the format of today's meeting, uh, we will be beginning with a quick introduction of our speaker, followed by his presentation, and then a question and answer session. After the Q&A section, we'll be posting the shadowing certificate link in chat, and we ask that all members stay muted throughout the presentation so that we can limit interruptions and distractions. Please feel free to add any questions or comments that may arise in the Zoom chat, and I'll now be passing it over to Adam, the other co-founder of the organization, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Noor. Hello, everyone. And as Noor mentioned, I'm a co-founder of the organization. It is so great to see all of you that joined today. We are so happy that you're able to attend this meeting. We want to once again thank Dr. Shao for taking the time to present today. To quickly provide an introduction, Dr. Shao is a distinguished professor in chemistry at Stony Brook University. Dr. Shao has a notable reputation in polymer science with over 600 scientific publications. His current research interests are focused on the development of sustainable nanomaterials from underutilized biomass for water purification. Please remember to stay muted throughout the duration of the presentation to minimize distractions. Again, if any questions do arise, please type them in the Zoom chat and we will get to answering them at the end of the presentation. With that being said, we will now hand the floor over to Dr. Shao for his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Very good. Well, to start with, I really want to thank the organizer of the Global Health Youth Organization. Yeah, I wish uh, when I was your age, I had such uh, opportunities, which I didn't. And um, so today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different than what you have uh, heard from the lectures before. That is, the title is quite technical. It's extracting nanocellulose from diverse biomass feedstocks for water purification. And But let's not to be too technical. Let's talk about the... The reason I want to do this research, as we know that uh, right now we have uh, COVID virus and other public health crisis and water crisis, all kinds of human conflicts. The reason for that is because they just, the population growth is so rapid on earth. As you can uh, see that today we, are already close to seven, over seven billion people now. So in another 80 years or so, when you guys get to my age or, or you're gonna, the earth gonna have more than close to 10 billion people or more. And so the resources will be uh, uh, consumed, all kinds of crises that will, you guys have to help solve. And uh, 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 so the population growth is major one problem. But let's look at all the continent. The fastest growing continent is actually Africa. So uh, all the rest of continent are actually slowing down the growth. So, uh, uh, so that uh, prompted me to try to deal with the number one major issue that's water crisis and start with Africa. If I can help Africa, I can probably help everywhere. So uh, water problem is well known everywhere. Today we all worry about the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but there will be new viruses uh, generated every day and uh, just matter of time. And every now and then you have a pandemic. So water crisis is actually a crisis that we all share. And we all know that uh, if waters human right, and in, in Africa, there are probably many people have lost their right. And uh, uh, so let's see what we can do to help to deal with this crisis. So start in 20, oh, uh, 2005, actually working on a technology called nanofibers technology. And technology was quite successful. I make nanofibers out of synthetic plastic materials. 
and uh, eventually I generate a filter uh, that's nanofibers filters. I can use gravity to remove all the bacteria, viruses, in some of the uh, 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 toxic metal ions. And the technology is quite successful. It actually led to several startup companies, and one is called Liquidity. Liquidity actually won this tech crunch uh, winner uh, in the green chemistry aspect of it. However, I was also invited by this gentleman. His name is Richard Leakey. Uh, Leakey is truly a legend and because his father discovered Lucy human uh, fossils that dated back to 1.5 years old. And, uh, and his family's work really has laid the foundation of we knowing this, uh, the, the human actually started in Africa and Richard is a Kenyan. So he invited me to actually to visit his work. He's obviously a paleoanthropologist, also a conservationist. He's the one who's actually raised the awareness of uh, elephant poaching. So he's truly a legend. So uh, where do we go? We actually went to this Kenya uh, near this uh, riverbed. It's called Takana Basin Institute. That's all the human uh, fossils uh, spread in the whole riverbed area. All those are the pictures that uh, he had uh, published in the journal uh, Nature. And those are the cover pictures. It's truly a, 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 a very important site to understand the human origin. And uh, the lake is a salt water lake is brackish water. It's not really drinkable because it's just too salty. It's one of the largest salt, salt water lake or brackish water lake in Africa. And the local people actually there to uh, get fresh drinking water, they cannot use the lake. They have to walk for about one hour each way to some river or other uh, water, surface water area to get drinking water. As you can see the two pictures, there's a mother here and there's a, a girl, each of them, their job is to get fresh drinking water. And they live in this, this, this hub. And they basically made up all kinds of materials and from uh, plastic to aluminum to, to, to grass, if you wish. They're very, very poor, and they're probably the uh, daily income for the whole family is less than a dollar or so. So, uh, and this is the other side. So uh, at that time, they cannot afford the water purification, the nanofibers filter, which I invented because which will cost the five, $10 per bottle and they can simply not afford those technology. If water is a basic human right, and those people simply do not have any right, or they lost their right to do this, to live in the, in the productive life. And uh, so that prompted me to try to explore technology that's really affordable. Because we think about it today, all water purification uh, technologies. And for us, they're not a major issue because we can afford it. But for about bottom 10% uh, of the population on earth, they actually cannot afford it. So, uh, and I was using nanofibers made of synthetic polymers to, uh, to make my filters. So that prompted me to think about other ways I can extract much cheaper and simpler and cost-effective uh, uh, materials, and even better materials. And so that leads to this nanocellulose technology. So what is nanocellulose? Nanocellulose is basically a building block of any higher plants, 
So uh, typical higher plants can loosely divide into woody plants and non-woody plants. Here's the wood. And basically during the biosynthesis and the enzyme will take sugar and molecules and generate a long natural polymer that's called cellulose. So cellulose is actually being uh, made by biosynthesis is a natural fibrils. So I'm interested in extracting this natural uh, uh, nanofibers from any plant, uh, wood or non-wood plant. And uh, why do I want to do that? Because nanocellulose uh, 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 can be used as a wide range of water purification materials. They can be used as an adsorbent to absorb all the contaminants, absorbent membranes materials, just like filters or fluctuant. And uh, they can also hold uh, a catalyst so they can, uh, they can become scaffold for photo degradation catalysts like TiO2 to degrade all the uh, uh, water contaminants, or they can be even used as disinfectants. So they have tremendous um, 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 potentials. Why nano? Because nano means they're very, very small, and they're also very safe. We generate nanocellulose just by eating those plants all the time, and they have zero calories, totally non-harmful to people, and, uh, and they have lots of surfaces. And lots of surface is good for uh, contaminant uh, uh, extraction or removal. So how do you make nanocellulose? Well, uh, you have top-down approach and bottom-up approach. Top-down approach is you take a feedstock or like woody plants or non-woody plants, you can treat them chemically and you can try to denaminate them. Why do you use chemistry to do this denamination process? Because chemistry, for example, like an acid, they can degrade all the lignin components or, or hemocellulose components and they're, they're functioned as a glue for a plant. You can dissolve them and also you can uh, uh, oxidize the surface. Once you oxidize the surface, the surface will be charged. If they charge, it takes a very, very little energy to defibrillate that. But if you don't uh, uh, create the charged surface, you just take higher energy to degrade that. So which uh, method that uh, I'm interested in, in, in it? Of course, I use a, 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 a surface modification to generate charged surface. So it can use very little energy to degrade them because at the end, energy is the key. And if people, if the technology takes tremendous energy, then it's really expensive. So all about the chemistry wise, the, this tempo oxidation method, it generates the lowest energy. So this becomes my benchmark. Another way to make nanofibers is actually bottom up, is you can, can take a, a sugar water uh, or juice if you wish. You can use enzyme to, uh, to mimic biosynthesis and make fibers, but you need sugar water. to start competing with food. So this is relatively expensive process. So, Tempo oxidation method, basically, uh, 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 it's actually a pretty straightforward oxidation process. Uh, this is uh, cellulose molecules. Cellulose have this OCH2OH group. This we call hydroxyl groups. There's a three sites for hydroxyl groups. This site is actually connected to CH2, which is a little bit more hydrophobic. So the tempo oxidation is a very mild uh, uh, oxidation process, 
which will only selectively only attack this OH group and generate the COO and A group, which is a salt. This is a carboxylated uh, with a sodium. So in the water, this will be dissociated. So therefore generate a negatively charged surface. So carboxylate group at the C6 position on the cellular surface will be charged. So you generate a charged surface. Charged surface is great because uh, it will interact with positively charged counter iron. So that's the reason you can use it to remove all the uh, toxic metal iron because they will uh, react with this, this group. But however, tempo oxidation methods is very elegant, but not necessarily environmentally friendly, as you can tell. They're, uh, they're exotic, and uh, 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 even the process is very effective from, from hydroxyl group to aldehyde group to carboxyl group to becomes a salt. And, uh, and this is the reagent that you need to use. You need to, if you use them, you need to recycle them. If you were to use this for all the biomass, then how, just imagine how much toxic uh, chemicals will you need to generate. Probably quite tremendous. It's, therefore, it's not sustainable. So uh, our approach is a little bit different. And we invented a uh, natural oxidation method. <laughs> actually, if we didn't invent it. The methods actually have been demonstrated by different people throughout the history since 1930s or so. Just nobody had ever tried to use uh, to extract nanocellulose. So we use two components, nitric acid and sodium nitride. And those two components are quite common because they're common ingredients for fertilizer making process. They're toxic. They're, uh, 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 we know how to handle them because we use to make fertilizer uh, 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 for this process. And they're at the right condition, when you have sodium nitrite plus uh, nitric acid, you can selectively also uh, uh, only oxidize the C6 position. It has exactly the same functional group. Function, uh, 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 it can do a, uh, carry out the same function as a temporal oxidation method. But uh, uh, if you compare the traditional way to extract nanocellulose versus this new process, uh, to extract them. And uh, uh, to start with, you start with a raw biomass, which is, means untreated biomass. Traditional method is you first to remove all the group first. Uh, uh, so this is called uh, 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 denuclefication or pulping process. Then you have to bleach them, you do tank oxidation, then you mechanically treat them to make your nanofibers. With a new process, with these two components using major ingredients of, of fertilizers, you can do one step treatment because natural gas can remove uh, 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 lignin and hemocellulose simultaneously. So you can have one step and uh, you can also generate these materials. And guess which one is simpler and takes less energy and less chemicals? Of course, it's this one. So this becomes the base for our way to uh, extract dendrocellulose by using uh, uh, natural oxidation methods of pulping because it combines pulping and cellulose oxidation at the same step and saves tremendous energy, water, and chemicals. And the methods is particularly suitable to extract nanocellulose from non-woody plants. Why is non-woody plants? Because uh, uh, if you look at the plant science, uh, usually uh, this type of materials, they're 
they're called non-woody pines. And their structure is also looser and they grow very, very fast. And, uh, and they mostly they're underutilized and because they're not as strong as wood to make furniture or houses and they take tremendous process to actually make strong uh, cardboard box or, or paper. But there are very, uh, uh, they can be used to extract nanocellulose quite easily because they have very, very uh, uh, a small amount of lignin content. So the structure is also very loose. And, uh, and the reason is just a chemistry why they can be extracted to, from the raw biomass because nitric acid and it's a, a, a very effective components to actually degrade the lignin con content and, uh, and the degraded compounds can be dissolved into water. They also can decompose the hemocellulose uh, component. Therefore, the degraded products can also be dissolved into a, uh, uh, the water uh, uh, process. And there are tremendous amount of underutilized non-woody plants. For example, you think about it, that's the, from agriculture residues. Agriculture basically is a major uh, 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 industry to generate food. But if you think about the food that we eat, we only eat small part of the biomass from food crops. Most of them, we actually, they're waste. The agricultural residues each year, they're a tremendous amount. They're truly underutilized. And if you look at their composition, the lignin content's always very small. So they're very, very effective, uh, very ideal feedstock to extract nanocellulose for water purification. So we can deal with food and water <coughs> simultaneously. And uh, just to show you uh, two examples of how do you upcycling, not recycling. Cycle usually you generate less value of a product. Upcycling, you start with no value and generate some value. So if you use uh, uh, agave uh, leaves uh, in the US, actually there's a tremendous agave leaves and we simply just use it as a landscaping and, uh, and they grow really, really fast. They usually, they have no value uh, after the, the landscaping uh, usage. And uh, this is at Stony Brook campus. We have this agave plants. In the winter, we just, usually we just collect them, we put on the sidewalk for disposal and we all lab just went there and pick out two bags of it. And we use as a feedstock, we use nitro oxidation method to actually generate this is very high quality of nanocellulose. Of course, we take a few steps, but the steps we use is much less than the tempo oxidation method typically used for wood to generate nanocellulose. And uh, the more importantly is the effluent after this natural oxidation treatment. It consists of unreacted reagent from nitric acid or nitrate, as well as the degraded cellulose, hemocellulose compound, we simply can neutralize with uh, another base. We generate some salt mixed with the degraded uh, biomass component. After we dry it, then they become a new type of fertilizers. So we don't have to recycle the effluent. Effluent can be used directly to turn into a fertilizer. And we actually, to compare with the uh, uh, commercial fertilizer and find out they're actually very, very efficient. And uh, another example is we actually use some underutilized uh, non-woody plant that from Australia, this is called Spinifex. Spinifex actually it has a similar 
uh, uh, cousins in California, uh, Oregon, as uh, you can tell in Oregon, California, all the white wildfires and they, uh, they cause tremendous issues, environmental issues, because all this dry grass and they, uh, they're easy to burn. Actually, we take this 70% of Australia is covered by this, this spinifex, has zero value. And uh, we actually use this spinifex as one of the natural resources to actually extract a very high quality nanofiber for this. And nanofibers of the extraction by nitro oxidation method is actually, as you uh, remember, is a, a, a negatively charged. Actually, we can use this a negatively charged nanocellulose as a fluctuant or coagulant to actually to coagulate the uh, cadmium. Cadmium ions is typically used for electronic industry. After you use it, some cadmium will actually leak into the environment and contaminate the drinking water. Usually it's very, very difficult to remove them. We actually the uh, the cellulose suspension is a wonderful coagulant to actually grab the cadmium uh, uh, iron and um, precipitate down. And the, the reason that is happening is because the cadmium and uh, will react with the cellulose, therefore forming this coagulant or flock. And uh, you can see this is white angle X-ray diffraction. And uh, you can see all the cadmium uh, hydroxide group uh, uh, or crystals being established. And actually, they, uh, uh, they're very, very good absorbent to remove this cadmium. The removal capacity uh, of uh, cellulose nanofibers made uh, by this natural oxidation method, the maximum absorption capacity because they're nanoscale, they're actually higher than most of the well-known absorbent that's been published. Uh, those are the other reference and different type of materials from inorganic to synthetic polymers, actually this naturally observed or extracted cellulose, nanocellulose from, from uh, uh, spinifex. And this actually outperformed all of them. So uh, it, it's not just uh, spinifex can be used as a feedstock. Actually, you can go back to all the uh, agricultural residues from uh, sorghum so to maize to beanstalk to actually to millet stock, they actually, they all can be used to extract nanocellulose and they're all negatively charged. So they can be all used to uh, uh, remove uh, metal ions. For example, we have tested lead, uranium oxide, uh, uh, TI right here. Uh, uh, so uh, after you form this uh, flock, you can simply just use a filter paper, which can also be made of nanocellulose to remove them. So, uh, and, and so this becomes a very interesting way to, uh, 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 a very inexpensive way to remove toxic metal iron. Another uh, last example, which we want to uh, uh, show to you is to remove and recover one of the, another uh, waste resource, that's nitrate from the wastewater. And as we all uh, uh, humans, animals, we generate nitrates all the time. And we, every time we go to a bathroom, we generate in some nitrate to start from urea. And, uh, and that's also tremendous underutilized. Usually we spend billions of dollars to try to remove nitrogen from drinking water, but that nitrate can be recovered. It's a fertilizer. 
too. So usually nit nitrites uh, can be uh, generated into a um, start with a urea, you know, uh, from your typical urine from any animals, it becomes uh, nitrites, nitrates, and eventually you have to go through this process synthetically using a lot of energy to actually convert that back to uh, the nitrogen gas. So uh, a nit a nitrile oxide or NOx is a major pollutant or greenhouse gases in the whole world because of this, this process. But let's try to turn this crisis or this, this waste that we have not used is let's try to upcycle them. How do you upcycle them? Well, we again, that we want to demonstrate one can use this nanocellulose because they're positively charged, because they're negatively charged. So we try to use it to directly absorb ammonium, which is positive charge. So we use a, a, a nitro oxidized cellulose dental fibers, try to see if we can directly remove ammonia. Uh, 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 yes, we can because ammonium uh, is positive charge in the, in the water, nanocellulose is negatively charged. So uh, uh, you increase the charge, you increase the removal capacity. Actually, removal capacity is actually uh, similar or even not better than many of the existing uh, uh, materials. And, uh, and they're very, very inexpensive. So, uh, and this, after we remove the ammonia, uh, then we generate new kinds of fertilizer. And this is just another plot to uh, show you this ammonia loaded microfibers or nanofibers. The difference between the two is basically uh, nanofibers and takes more purification process. Uh, the microfibers take less purification process, therefore they're actually cheaper to make. So this is to compare with starter, the typical fertilizer. Control means no fertilizer. We actually try to see the number of plants growth and the microfibers actually much outperform the starter fertilizer. So we generate another type of fertilizer by upcycling the human waste. The ammonia. So where does this go? So we envision this will generate new kinds of uh, a circular economy. And we take uh, agricultural residues, we make this cellulose absorbent, we can actually recover. So we upcycle this uh, 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 underutilized biomass, we also upcycle this uh, wastewater and extract the nitrogen. We make the new fertilizers. So it's a much greener process. It's not only good for food, energy, water nexus, also uh, significantly reduce the nitrile oxide uh, emission into the air, the greenhouse effect. So this is my last uh, technical uh, slide now. And, uh, uh, two years ago, I had a pretty large uh, a group of uh, uh, students, and in this is summer of 2019, we have uh, eight uh, high school students during that period of time, the rest of my graduate students, postdoc, as well as undergraduate students, and all of that eight uh, high school students, I think five won some recognition uh, with Regenera, uh, 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 various of uh, distinction. And uh, in the past two years, I was not able to accept any uh, high school students because of COVID, uh, because my lab is completely hands-on uh, exper uh, experimental lab. Hopefully next year, the situation will change. I'll be able to host uh, more high school students later. So with that, close my talk. Be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. That was 
That was super, super informative. And we really want to thank you. This is such a complex subject and you broke it down so beautifully. So uh, we will now begin the Q&A section of the presentation. So uh, we will first start with the questions that were asked through the registration form. And then after that, we will get to any questions that were asked in the Zoom chat. So this is your opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So please ask whatever you have in your mind. I will now hand the floor over to one of our board members, Mark, to read the questions that were asked. Uh, thanks, Adam. So uh, first question we wanted to go over was uh, on the topic of water purification, how can this process be spanned worldwide to effectively reach lower income regions facing water crises? Well, uh... Uh, we believe the chemistry uh, uh, is not that complicated. Uh, and we also use some uh, very basic ingredients and typically uh, 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 we, we can make fertilizer out of the, these ingredients. So, uh, so we hope that uh, if people are smart uh, throughout the whole world. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, we believe that uh, once we demonstrate a scalable uh, process, we can disseminate them quite easily, and uh, and farmers can learn it, and uh, they can work with their local uh, uh, engineers to design their local systems. I think we just try to demonstrate a a, a pathway. To, to, to do this and uh, we invite all the people to innovate and improve the pathways with us and to, that we can disseminate throughout the whole world. Uh, now, is this method safe and efficient or is it still in its infancy and we're still you know, not exactly sure? Uh, safe, uh, of course, uh, fertilizer, you know, the, too much fertilizer, if you store it, becomes uh, explosive, right? So uh, all chemicals are not safe. They need to be handled very, very carefully. So the safety issue is, uh, is number one of our concern for this process. But however, uh, we also know how to make fertilizer for a very long time. And so I think potentially the methods can be safe, uh, but there are certain uh, uh, apparatus and, and a procedure needs to be developed. And that's exactly what we are doing our, in our lab. Yeah, I think safety is the number one priority. And uh, next question we had was, is what made you wanted to go, what made you wanna go into this line of work? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, you know, I'm 62 years old now. With my career, I, I can work on anything I want to work on. But, uh, but finding the opportunities to really help the entire population uh, to lift the, the, the bottom of human, uh, this pyramid, is, is, is hard. the opportunity is hard to come by. So I decided to really work on something truly will benefit everybody rather than just a, a, a small population or top 10 of the population that can afford. And uh, so I, I decided this is truly a meaningful project for me to spend the rest of my life with. And hopefully I can inspire quite a few people to join me in this amazing journey uh, water uh, is a hum basic human right. And everybody needs for, uh, uh, low cost drinking water. And uh, it should not be just for uh, us who can afford. Uh, it should be available for everybody. Uh, well said. Uh, now, in your opinion, what's the greatest experience you've had uh, throughout your career? Greatest experience to see that actually the technology can be implemented and, and turn out to be very useful uh, to the society. You know, uh, uh, my first experience is uh, this uh, liquidity technology using nanofiber uh, made of synthetic materials. Actually, it works. Constantly uh, say, holy moly, actually it works. Well, I hope that 
But again, it's expensive. Uh, uh, I wish this technology, the current technology I'm working on, truly not only work well, but actually can be very, very cheap. That would be my happiest moment. Uh, now, on the flip side, uh, what, what have been some of the struggles that you've been facing in your career or have faced in your career? Yes, struggling is, uh, is uh, uh, again, that uh, although I try to be an entrepreneur, I'm more of an inventor, researcher. And uh, the struggling is always try to bridge that gap from the laboratory to commercialization. And uh, 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 I'm uh, usually I'm naive. I, I think things very simple, uh, uh, simple. But to get a product to be commercialized, I really am just a kindergarten and try to learn my way how to commercialize uh, those products, which turned out to be quite challenging. And but we're getting there. It took me some time, and. Uh, uh, that's very challenging and very frustrating. Thank you for that. Uh, now, what has COVID-19, uh, how has COVID-19 affected your career? Any changes, any setbacks? Uh, not affecting my career. My career is okay. Affecting uh, lots of uh, opportunities for students. And uh, I think uh, all of you, probably miss one or two years of the typical uh, experience that you should have received. And I see that in my students, like, uh, like even with high school students, I cannot mentor uh, uh, in person those students for two years. Also, some of my projects got delayed uh, in Africa because now they have COVID and uh, we stopped uh, uh, the experimental part, even though we have weekly meetings, but it's hard to go there and visit to work with those people and nothing is the same by uh, having Zoom talk and talking to those people. So, uh, but uh, hopefully we all learn how to deal with this pandemic and, uh, and, 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 and restart again even stronger. Well said. So now uh, we're going to go into the questions that were typed into the Zoom chat. And uh, the first question we have here is, what is your goal with your research in the next five years? My goal in the... <laughs> I am working really hard to, uh, to translate the bench research to something truly useful. And uh, that's my biggest challenge. And that's all my teams are working right now. And uh, we're learning how to uh, commercialize this uh, technology. Technology, in our opinion, is truly good. It does have its challenges from, uh, from how, how do you handle uh, the safety issue in larger scale to, uh, to how do you disseminate to different communities. So that's probably five years, I would say 10 years, I'm going to be doing that. All right. Uh, now the last question we had in the Zoom chat was, what advice would you give to a starting student in the science and medical field? And where should they start to gain research experience? Yeah, I, I have mentored quite a bit of pre-med students. They all want to go to a medical school. As you know that if even you want to go to medical schools, and one, one of the experiences they uh, look for your, to evaluate your qualification is the diversity of your experience, right? Diverse experience. And uh, many of the fundamental research I'm doing here actually have very strong public health impact. Okay, uh, so uh, 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 I think uh, with a basic research uh, like this, with a goal of 
how do you help people in a more realistic way through research, you probably will make a better physician in the long run too. Because the physician shall have a much broader view. How do you help people in different way? Oh, great. Thanks for the help on that. Uh, we just had one more question that was just typed in. Uh, and it said, uh, how is it meeting Mr. Leakey? And I've heard about his parents' research, and it is so cool. Oh, uh, Richard is a Stony Brook faculty member. And uh, he's, uh, he's really cool. Imagine him never finished high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, He's, he got an honorary degree, PhD degree from Oxford, if I'm not wrong. And uh, his entire, re entire life is all about research and uh, try to find out the origins of human. And uh, 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 so education is something that is just, you know, without limit. You keep learning, you keep learning. And uh, he's a visionary. Uh, I mean, I'm humble. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to know him and reasonably well and uh, be part of his legacy. He's uh, truly a, a cool, cool human being. Uh, just one more final question that was just inserted. Uh, how did you come up with the idea of this research project? Ah, uh, so uh, if you think back to research <laughs> uh, presentation I just presented to you, I start with uh, something nano fibers made of synthetic materials. I can give you an uh, elaborate talk, but let's think about it. Synthetic polymers, you need energy resource plants to make those materials. So to start with, very expensive. Then they're also not degradable. We all have this issue with why, what do we do with all those uh, polymers? Why you want plastic, once you make, they cannot be degraded. So uh, 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 that uh, prompted me to think about, hey, how do I truly use something that's uh, sustainable, green, cheap, uh, I don't have to worry about the environmental impact. And, uh, and more importantly, there are vast amounts. And uh, so that prompted me to think through uh, all the materials we have. And uh, the biomass is a natural fit, fit right? <laughs> we have so much biomass. And most of the time, we don't even think about it. We just, you know, we think they're green, we degrade them, and, and we don't utilize them. So they are truly underutilized, very sustainable. They're everywhere. And uh, so that, that prompted me to start my this line of research. Okay, and uh, that's all we had for the questions. And thank you so much for all those amazing answers. Once okay. again, I'd like to thank Dr. Xiao for taking his time today to show us an introduction to his great research. And thank you all so much for attending today's presentation. Please use the link posted in chat to obtain your shadowing certificate. Thank you all so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you in our next monthly meeting. And we'll stick around for a couple of minutes to make sure everyone has access to the link. Thank you. <laughs>